U.S. Marnish Radio is part of designnetwork.org, exclusive architecture and design podcasts reaching creative listeners worldwide. Hi, this is jazz singer Sophie Melman, and you're listening to U.S. Modernist Radio. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Oh, I don't care what mama don't allow, gonna draw mine modern anyhow. Mama don't allow no architecture around here. Welcome to U.S. Modernist Radio, where we talk and laugh with people who enjoy, own, create, dream about, preserve, love, and hate modernist architecture, the most exciting and controversial buildings in the world. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I'm gonna go when the volcano blows. Mr. Gumbe. But joining us is geologist and volcanologist Tom Wright. Now, if that's not exciting enough right there, a smoking guest, he's also the grandson of Frank Lloyd Wright and lives in a Wright house. Also joining us is Wright author Stephen Reese and later music from the breakout singer of the 1961 Newport Jazz Festival, Carol Sloan. And now, wasting away in Margaritaville, here's your host, Mr. Modernism, George Smart. Thank you, Tom. And thank you, Jimmy Buffett. It was May 1979, and a little song called Volcano hit the charts. Jimmy Buffett wrote about a volcano on the Caribbean island of Montserrat, but everyone associates the long popular song with the 1980 Mount St. Helens eruption in Washington state. That volcano, plus all those margaritas, were very, very good for Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> yes. He is now one of the richest musicians in the world at an eye popping $550 million a chain of Margaritaville restaurants, and incredibly, his own Margaritaville retirement village. No. Where senior fans, oh lovingly called parrot heads, can live out their days <laughs> covered in oil where it's happy hour all the time. U.S. Marnish Radio is underwritten by Wendy Robineau and Don Beskin, and by Marnish realtor Angela Roll. In our continuing world of make-believe, Angela Roll was a spy for the deep architectural state, making sure that great modernist architecture was not wiped out by devout classicists pining for an earlier time, like the 1800s. Codenamed The Broker, accompanied by her financier boyfriend at the time, codenamed Zero Interest, they were called upon to restore the terrazzo floors in Saarinen's TWA building. Traveling from the AIA headquarters in Washington to Austin, Minnesota, they stole the secret formula for Spam, which coincidentally makes for an excellent floor wax or dessert topping. On the flight back to Washington, Zero Interest flirted shamelessly with a woman named Jennifer, who was breaking up with another guy named Brad, who had just taken up with a woman named Angelina. By the time the plane landed, Angela told Zero Interest to hit the road, and two days later she accepted a proposal from International Hospital Executive Eric, whose love for her was long a pre-existing condition. <laughs> you know, this is like in Homeland, when Carrie has all the different lines in her sect. <laughs> Today, Angela continues to defend modernism, plus she has spam recipes that are surprisingly delicious. If you haven't fried it, you haven't tried it. Reach modernist realtor Angela Roll at AngelaRoll.com. That's R-O-E-H-L or 919-995-0550. Thank you, Tom. Tom Wright is a grandson of the late, very great, in his own mind particularly, Frank Lloyd Wright. In Bethesda, Maryland, Tom owns the house his grandfather designed for his parents, Robert and Betty Wright. It is the only Wright design residence still in Wright family hands. The last one before that was the David Wright House in Phoenix, which we talked about with past podcast guests Victor City and Amanda Hugh. Tom has dedicated significant time, energy, and funds to preserving this house and his grandfather's legacy, though he never had an interest in being an architect himself. Tom attended Johns Hopkins and studied geology. He went on to become a volcano specialist who worked in both Hawaii and Japan. He's even been invited to play with his string quartet on a volcano field. Welcome, Tom. Um, thank you. Stephen Reese grew up in Chicago and always wanted to be an architect. Then he did something about it. He studied architecture at the IIT in Chicago and then worked for C.F. Murphy. 
H&TB hired Stephen in 1973, where he eventually became chairman of Architecture Services, known for his work in airport construction. He is now a nationally recognized expert on Frank Lloyd Wright, particularly Usonian house designs. Stephen has given numerous presentations and lectures, including for the AIA, the National Building Museum, the Branch Design Museum of Richmond, Virginia Tech, and at other Wright sites around the country. He also taught adult education classes on Wright's Usonian houses at the University of Richmond. Stephen also wrote a book about Frank Lloyd Wright's Pope Leahy House in Virginia, and he's got another one coming on the Robert Newellen Wright House, where Tom lives. Welcome, Stephen. George, thank you. It's great to be here. So, Tom Wright, you mapped a lot of areas in Hawaii that were prone to volcano damage, which is like lava going through the living room. But there was a lot of resistance to that. I did produce a hazard map for the island that uh, superseded a, a one done previously. And uh, there, I suppose, were some people who didn't like living in Zone 1, but uh, that didn't seem to stop them from doing it. People would build anyway. Yeah. Even though there was some probability of lava flow at some time. Yes, even if there was a high probability. Which is what Zone 1 meant, I guess. Yeah, right. Yeah. Is there insurance for lava? Can you buy a hazard for that? Well, my understanding is that people protect themselves with fire insurance because the house will start to burn before the lava actually hits it. Okay. So by the time <laughs> the lava hits the house, it's just covering up charcoal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That makes sense. What is the temperature of lava, Tom? You would know this. Well, when it comes out of the vent, it's it's uh, about uh, 1180 or 70, 70 or 80 degrees centigrade. Which is what in Fahrenheit, like 6,000 or something? It's huge. What is well, it, Tom? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what it is in, in uh, Fahrenheit. But our our Tom is doing the calculations now on his uh, phone. Yeah. <laughs> Hang on. Hang on. This is our science corner. 2,138 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh, wow. That's a big number. So as that is heading towards your house, mm -hmm. it's going to start burning things before it gets there. You're going to want to hit the road. Yeah, pretty quick. Well, we had in the 1990 and or 1989 and 1990, lava came down toward the area of Kalapana, which consisted of a modern Kalapana village and an ancient Hawaiian village of Kalapana. And the lava virtually wiped out both of those areas and on its way to the ocean where it filled a uh, former surfing area with new land. But in that time, I was in charge of the observatory, and we had a daily, four of us were daily monitoring the progress of the lava flow so that we could uh, inform civil defense at the end of each day what our prognosis was for overnight. And so that allowed civil defense to make a very closely timed evacuation of people. In other words, not kicking out of their houses until until it was absolutely necessary, and so no, no lives were lost. How fast does lava flow? Well, it depends. Uh, on a very steep slope, it can be, I think, something like 30 miles an hour. Wow. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it moved that fast. But on a more gentle slope, of course, it, it moves uh, more slowly. So, Tom, your grandfather, Frank Lloyd Wright, what was he like? You spent the summers of the late 40s through 1951 at Taliesin East in Wisconsin, the ancestral home. You know, I spent three years there in the summers, but I, I'm i not sure I ever even shook his hand. I do remember I lived in the family quarters, but I was under the care of, of his uh, last wife, Ogavana, and uh, I remember seeing him taking visitors and uh, clients around, but I... Uh, don't know if I ever formally met him. I certainly saw a lot of him in the in the various things that went on at Taliesin, including uh, weekends where the fellowship gathered either for a movie and music in the theater or or in the family home for more music and uh, dinner at both places. How many of the Wright family was on the campus there in addition to all the students? Well, I think uh, 
after the school was formed, Eric, my cousin Eric, who is the third generation architect, son of the of his first son, Frank Lloyd Wright Jr. I think Eric was there as an apprentice, but that's the only family member I knew that was there as an apprentice. Both my brother Tim and my cousin Nora also spent some summers there, but not as apprentices. Well, what was that like for you, not being in architecture, hanging out at Taliesin? Oh, it was great fun. I I learned a lot of farming techniques and how to how to drive tractors and trucks and did various farm work things, shocking oats, for instance, which was very difficult for me because I was small, small for my age. It was a lot of work, but it was also a lot of fun, and I spent most of my time hanging out with the younger apprentices. And Can you tell us, City Slickers, what shocking oats involves? I'm not sure. I actually looked it up myself. <laughs> but you did it. <laughs> yeah, I, I looked it up myself, and I've, I've forgotten what it but it's, it's basically like pitching hay. It's, it's putting okay. things into, you know, where, where it can be transported. Okay. No electricity involved. Now, Stephen, how did you get first exposed to Frank Lloyd Wright? I mean, other than in school where everybody studies him, when did you actually go to a building that Wright had designed? Uh, the first time, George, I went to a building designed by Wright, I was uh, probably eight or nine years old. I was uh, living in my parents' apartment on the south side of Chicago in the High Park neighborhood, not far from the University of Chicago. And uh, as most of my kid friends did on Halloween, we decided to go out trick-or-treating. And there were two houses that we always walked by, which looked different than the other houses. But we still went up there, and we still got our candy, and we still uh, had a great Halloween. And this happened for three or four years in a row. But it was only many years later that I found out that the first house I went to with my friends was the Heller house, which was about a block away from where my parents lived. And the second house was the Roby house, which was about three blocks away from my parents. So I want to take a long leap here and say I could be one of the few people that actually went trick-or-treating at two Frank Lloyd Wright houses <laughs> in his early years. Wow. I like that. <laughs> what was the candy yeah. like? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, it was uh, either square, triangular, or circular, as I, <laughs> as I remember. <laughs> no hexagonal candies? Because no, I know he was no. into that for a while. No, hmm. no. Then I think the group after me, they, they got the circular and the hexagonal pieces of candy. But I always like to think that somehow that early exposure to write stayed in the back of my head. And then I sort of went through the normal process, a person living in Chicago and discovered Oak Park and uh, went to school and just really became totally fascinated by Wright and his work, and it was always so easy to access because I was in Chicago. There's so much is there. Mm. Yes. Now, Stephen, what makes living in a Frank Lloyd Wright house different from a traditional house? Well, having spoken to uh, a few owners of Wright houses and being able to fortunately call Tom a friend and Lauren Pope, who was a friend and owner of uh, Wright House, what they both have told me is that it is a lifestyle that you're buying into when you live in a Wright House. Certainly, there's materials that uh, are specially put together, and there's expanses of windows, but more than anything is the adaption that the owners have to make and the changes they have to make to live a lifestyle that befits the architecture that Wright gave them. Tom, what are some of those adaptations you have to do to live in a Wright house, something your grandfather designed? Well, I was in graduate school when the house was first um, completed. But when I visited from um, Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, I, I just found it the most wonderful place I've 
I'd ever been in to uh, read and listen to music. And I don't think there was any, there's nothing that I would say I had to adapt to uh, feel. But, but one thing I will note is that what I think grandfather would not approve of, for instance, uh, my CD collection, which is on top of things, of surfaces that I, I think he he wanted to keep clean. And there, there are a lot of other aspects of, of things that I think he would have objected to. But to me, there, there hasn't been any barriers or, or adaptation needed. Tom, did Wright design furniture for your parents as well, like he did for a number of houses? Yes, there's a, um, a living room table and hassocks that mimic the hemicycle plan of the house. And then there's a, a lot of furniture that's built in, and there's some freestanding flower holders and uh, tables and, and some lamps of various sorts, all of which are designed. So there there are some things, some furniture was not designed by him, but most of it in the house does represent him. Steve, can you describe hemicycles for our listeners? I assume that's not a new brand of Peloton. <laughs> no, uh, hemicycles represent uh, Wright's, actually, uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's last stylistic period. And what, what they represent in plan is intersecting and overlapping circles. And depending on the site and the topography and the terrain, the intersection of the two circles create these unique connection points. When you look at the Llewellyn house, Tom's father's house, you can see that the intersecting and overlapping circles that were planned by Wright come together and result in almost a football-shaped house. And when you look at it from above, it, it actually looks like a ship's hull with the prow pointing towards this beautiful forested ravine facing south. Wright only designed 12 houses that could be described as hemicycles, and 11 of them were built. But interestingly enough, the first one that he designed that began to explore circles and the circular form was in 1920 for a developer who wanted to develop Sugarloaf Mountain in Maryland. Nothing happened from that project, but subsequently 12 uh, hemicycles were designed, 11 were built, and then perhaps the most famous circular forms that Wright worked on was completed in 1959, which was the Guggenheim Museum. Oh, of course, So there's sure. a thread that connects from 1920 to 1959 Wright's use of circular forms. And the, um, my uncle's house in Phoenix uh, is somewhat like the Guggenheim Museum has circular plan. It has that big ramp going up to it, right? Yeah, big ramp. But not the artwork, I guess. No. Yeah, we visited that house a number of years ago, and it was really fascinating that they, like many modernist houses, it was having some disputes with its neighbors, but it has been bought by some architects who are in the process of fixing it up and preserving it and bringing it back to its original splendor. And can't wait to see how that all works out. Did you get to spend a lot of time there, Tom, growing up in Arizona? Uh, no, I. my parents took me there when I was a very young child. Once I went to Taliesin West, and then I, when I was going to college in California, I spent one Christmas vacation at Taliesin West. And, and more recently, when the... Frank Lloyd Wright Building Conservancy met in in Phoenix. My wife and I went and uh, stayed at Taliesin West. Now, does the Wright family still own the properties at Taliesin East in Wisconsin? Is that still the Wright lands up there? Well, I think I think much of it is. I think it's been reduced, maybe by sale of things that. Originally, the acreage was was quite large, but certainly the extant buildings are are on uh, right own property. Now, Steve, hemicycles, in sort of layman's terms, are sort of like semicircles, a real key in the airports that have been designed in the last twenty five years. The way the roofs are shaped and things like that. 
Is that a Russian influence, or did that come from someplace else in airports? Oh, I'm, I'm guessing, George, that it probably reflects more the uh, airfoil shape of the airplane wing and is a architectural way of reinforcing the movement of planes and people uh, going from one location to another. When I studied Wright, and he did so many different type of types of buildings, I can pretty comfortably say he was never asked to design an airport, but it would have been fascinating to see what would have come out of it if he had been. That would be cool to see a Frank Lloyd Wright airport. It would. It would. Stephen, how did you meet Lauren Pope, the original owner of the Pope Leahy House? Uh, I was working at the Pope Leahy House back in 2001 as a volunteer, as a docent on weekends. And I had opened up the house on Sunday for the morning tours when a racing green Jaguar pulled up and parked in the handicap spot, which was typically uh, frowned upon because the car had no license plates or stickers indicating that it was a handicapped person. A gentleman came to the door, knocked on the door. I hadn't opened up the house yet, dressed in a blue blazer and an ascot and a big head of silver hair. And I uh, opened up the door and I told him the first tour wasn't going to be ready for another 30 minutes. And he looked at me, crossed his arms and said, uh, I'm Lauren Pope and this is my house. <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't living there, huh? He was not living there. The house had already been moved to its current location, which is on the Woodlawn Pope Leahy Plantation, uh, owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation. But Lauren often made unannounced visits, as he did this one Sunday. He would come by to look at the house. He was living in Alexandria in another Wrightian-inspired house designed by a uh, architect from uh, Minneapolis, Norman Carver. But Lauren would often come by the house. He would talk to the docents. Once or twice a year, he would tell us stories about what it was like living in the house. And for some reason, George, uh, he and I just hit it off. We lived fairly close to each other, and uh, we liked a lot of the same things. And I offered to help him with his memoirs, which he was just starting to write. And we just grew closer and closer. And just before he passed away in 2008, he gave me all of his files and drawings and correspondence from uh, the house and working working with Wright. And I told him I would uh, write a book about the house with all the materials that he gave me. And uh, I finished it about five years later. Now, you mentioned that the Pope Leahy house had to be moved twice, I think. Why was that? Uh, the first time it was moved, it was found that it it was directly in the right-of-way of Interstate 66. This was before the Preservation Act of Historic Buildings had been put in place to protect structures such as the Pope House. And uh, the Virginia Department of Transportation had laid out the path for Interstate 66, and it literally went right through the living room of the house. Lauren was no longer living in it at that time. Uh, he and his wife, Charlotte, had sold it to Marjorie and Robert Leahy. And Marjorie Leahy, who was sort of the unsung hero of that story, took it upon herself to save the house. She ultimately negotiated an agreement with help from Stuart Udall, who was the Secretary of the Interior, to have the house purchased and moved to a piece of land owned by the National Trust where it is today, the Woodlawn Plantation. And Marjorie was allowed to live in the house uh, during the years that it was there until her death. About 15 years after it was moved there, it was found to be placed on a unstable section of marine clay, and it had to be uh, taken apart, dismantled, and moved again about 30 feet to its current location. Oops. Uh, I believe it's the only right house that actually has had to be dismantled, moved, and reassembled twice uh, in, its, in its life. How far away is it now from its original location? Uh, it's about nine miles driving time. Okay. I met Lauren, as I said, at the Pope Leahy house. I, years later, history repeated itself because I, I met Tom 
at the Pope Leahy house. And then I went over to Tom's house. He was giving a tour through the American Institute of Architects, and he generously opened up his house to a small group of us. And Tom and I hit it off also for a lot of reasons, and that has sort of brought us to this discussion and the book that I was able to put together for Tom. So I always look back at it as one of those strange events in my life that I was able to meet two owners of two of Wright's houses and develop long-term relationships with them. So are you still hanging out at the Pope Leahy house waiting to meet owners? That's right, waiting to see somebody come by. Yeah, in a Jaguar. (laughs) That's because you're a nice guy, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, I will go up there occasionally. There's another group of docents that has sort of moved on. Occasionally, I'll go up there and make give a presentation uh, on the house. And Richard Guy Wilson, who is a professor at University of Virginia, wrote the foreword for my book. And he told me something when I was working on it that still has stayed with me all, all these years. He said, if someone doesn't write about it, it will be forgotten. And I always remember that. And uh, I I realize, as time has gone by, how important that is for both the Pope Leahy House and for the Llewellyn House. Where can people get the book on the Llewellyn House? Well, this is an interesting situation. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Tom and I met. Tom uh, helped me with this. But I believe we, we met about 2014, 2015. And the Pope Leahy book was just about to come out, and Tom asked me over to his house to discuss doing a book on his house, and uh, I was still sort of exhausted from from working on the first one, but Tom was kind enough to sweeten the pot because he said, why don't you stay overnight here in my house, Oh boy! and we can talk about it tomorrow morning. So, of course, the next morning I was putty in his hands. I mean, he, he could have asked me for anything. So I agreed and jumped into it, spent time, obviously, with Tom, but also with his siblings, Elizabeth and Tim. Spent a lot of time in California at the uh, Getty Museum, whose collection of archival materials is, is, is just incredible, especially on this house. I mean, every letter ever written by Betty Llewellyn Wright is there. So once Tom and I decided to move forward with it, we... Uh, did the best we could. I finished the book in 2019. Uh, it took longer than I had expected, but uh, I did complete it. And I went ahead and published, printed actually a limited number of copies for Tom and his family. I wanted to make sure that he had a copy that his siblings did, that some of his relatives did. At the same time as I published the book, I also started discussions with a series of academic publishers around the country, and I'm currently waiting to hear back from them eagerly to see if they will do a larger scale printing for us. Cautiously optimistic. So to answer your question, George, it would be difficult but not impossible for someone to find a copy of this book. They could either call Tom or me, but what would be... uh, more reasonable is to wait until the book is actually published by a uh, large-scale publisher. So it's a very limited edition now. It is a very limited edition with a high value. Absolutely. Maybe we'll see it on eBay for thousands of dollars. I don't have any extra copies. In fact, I had to pay pay to get one for my wife. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Hey, Tom, I was going to ask you, as you were growing up, when did you first sort of become aware that your grandfather was a big deal? Well, I I think it must have been in elementary school. I remember I did, as one of my elementary school projects, I did a uh, paper mache mock-up of Broadacre City, which was his urban design. And I remember doing that in elementary school, so obviously I was aware at that time of, of the uh, heritage. And, and l- later on, it became, I really wanted to keep this house in the family. Sure. And that was only made possible when my sister actually renounced her inheritance at the time of, of my mother's death. So that left it to my brother and me to negotiate a settlement for the, the house. And so that was how I ended up owning it. And it was only only through the possibility of my sister not being part of the uh, equation. 
And what are your plans for the future of the house? How is how is it going to be twenty years from now? Well, my son and daughter are are. I mean, my son I think would like to live here, but I'm not sure his his wife feels the same way. And my daughter and son-in-law have have a house in Delaware that they've just are just moving into. So I suspect it's not going to remain in the family. But I would hope it would go to a nonprofit like Falling Water is, or some of the other properties that are managed by a by a nonprofit. Is there any kind of preservation easement on it now that you know of? Oh yes, yeah, we have preservation easement, and it's also on the Register of Historic Places. So it's possible that a private owner, maybe an older couple or someone who's single, could want to to actually live in it, but uh, I'm not counting on that. Now, Stephen, are you heading down to Virginia Beach next to write a book on The Cookhouse, also by Frank Lloyd Wright? Well, it's interesting you mentioned that, George, because I recently gave a presentation about the Wright Design Houses in Virginia, and someone in the audience did ask about The Cookhouse, uh, so it's possible and then the other one would be, of course, the uh, Lewis Martin House, which was constructed at just about the same time as the Llewellyn House. In fact, the apprentice, Bob Baharka, who oversaw the construction of the Llewellyn House, went immediately afterwards to Great Falls to work on the uh, Louise Martin House. So, yeah, that's always a possibility. There's two more houses in Virginia. Now, is the Martin House the one on the Potomac? It is the one on the Potomac. And in fact, there is correspondence that I found that that piece of property was the property that Wright had initially wanted Llewellyn to purchase for their house because it was such a dramatic site, number one. And number two, it was a very difficult site to build on, which, of course, made it a favorite for Wright. But Louise Martin and his wife actually bought the property before Frank Lloyd Wright could make that happen make that with happen Llewellyn. Yeah, yeah. So are you hoping to meet an owner of the cookhouse by hanging out at the Pope Leahy house again, make third times a charm? Yeah, I, I'm assuming that they won't show up in a racing green Jaguar, <laughs> probably a, a Tesla, maybe self-driven. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Let's go with the I'll, times. I'll keep my eyes open uh, since I've already had the pleasure of meeting two ride owners that way. Yeah, it's a rule of threes. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us and sharing the story about these houses. Thank you for all the great work you're doing, both writing about them and preserving them. Okay. Well, thank you for the interview. George, it was a pleasure. Thank you. A few months back, when we had singer Laura Ridgway on the show, we talked about some legendary North Carolina jazz clubs, including the Frog and Nightgown in Raleigh. That conversation led us to the jazz singer who inspired Laura, Carol Sloan. Carol has been singing professionally since age 14, and she broke out nationally at the Newport Jazz Festival back in the early 60s. Her Newport success led to albums for Columbia Records, Concord Records, and appearances at jazz clubs all over the world. Carol couldn't be with us today, which you'll hear about later, but we're thrilled to have Carol's manager, also the owner of another legendary North Carolina jazz club, Stevens After All. Stephen Barefoot is an actor, a commercial designer, and he's a veteran of the Peace Corps. He spent the last 40 years working in arts presenting, production, and artist representation for Carol Sloan, playwright Mike Wiley, and the Malpass Brothers. Welcome, Stephen. Hello there. Hey, Stephen. Before we get started, I have a question and a story. The question is, as our research department found out, did you really get kicked out of Clown College? (laughs) You've dug deep. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yes, I did. That's what brought me back to North Carolina from Vermont because I had resigned the job I was doing up there with the Experiment International Living because I was so sure I was going to be admitted into Clown College. Well, what happened? Was there a scandal? They just didn't seem to be too interested in me. It was the Aww. most incredible application I've ever filled out, and you had to write really long essays and a 2,000 
word essay on the last time you cried. I oh, remember that specifically. Really? How weird. And I, was, I, I didn't want to be a clown in the circus. I wanted the mime study that was part of Clown College, Ringling yeah. Brothers. And they, when they notified me that I wasn't accepted, they said they sensed through what I had submitted that I didn't want to be a clown. <laughs> well, I guess they pegged and, you, huh? <laughs> they did. <laughs> And that's what they were looking did for. Did they keep the tuition? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I hadn't paid it yet. But ah. I had resi- resigned my job in Vermont, being so cocky and sure that I was going to get in. So, <laughs> so, so cocky my, and sure that you didn't want to be a clown, but you could apply to clown college. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> well, the story is, is that I was a junior in college when I first went to this former Chinese disco in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, which was your new club called Stevens After All. And opening night, I think opening week, was with the wonderful Barbara Cook, right? Mm -hmm. Yep, the whole week. So that was an astonishing club, Stephen. I mean, nothing really like it had existed except for the frog and nightgown between Washington and Atlanta. Yeah, I think, I mean, we were very lucky and we were also unlucky in the fact that I think people were— we're so bent on expecting the big names all the time, which, of course, we couldn't do. Sustained. And so, you know, when we had those big names, they would be right there. We'd be sold out for, you know, all the names that Sloan helped bring in. But when it was up-and-comers or, or newer artists, then it was a small number of tables that were occupied. You know? I remember it was kind of a struggle because you expanded to, like, breakfast. You had a breakfast menu we're at back one point? In the, in the, in, after all, in the smaller room. Yeah, we were open back there from about 7 in the morning till 1 at night with piano going, live piano going on every day from about noon, I think, through the evening. Yeah. So. I remember going over there one time uh, and, and somebody was playing piano at 8 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice memory. It Thank was you. great. <laughs> Where brother, do you where do you get that? Nowhere. Brother Youssef was one of those people for a long oh, wow. time. Oh, really? There. He wow. was really kind of the regular house pianist along with a lot of other names that people would recognize within the Triangle area. But, yeah, it was a great little space back there. Now, how did you meet Carol Sloan? I met Carol when I was bartending at the Frog and Nightgown. Immediately when I started working there, people would come in. Every other person would ask me, well, have you met Carol Sloan yet? And then the other alternating person would ask, have you met Mitchell Barefoot yet? And so those were the two people I was most excited about meeting whenever they showed up just because they had been pointed out to me so much. And I met Carol then and, you know, I became a huge fan and good friend and was with her during the time she was living in North Carolina. And then she left and went to Boston. And then when I opened Stevens, I remember the call to her just thinking I'd I don't even know what I'm doing here. I'm, I was a bartender at the Frog. I have no idea about booking jazz. I was more attuned to the sort of the cabaret scene, and that's where I got so enamored with Barbara Cook. Right. Um, but as far as the jazz roster, it was completely foreign to me at the time. So that's when the telephone call came, went to Carol and saying, don't you want to move back down to North Carolina? And she and said she did. yes. And she yes, did. she did. Yeah. Now, let's fast forward. Okay. What's happened with Carol now? Carol suffered a stroke last June, June of 2020, and has been in hospitals and rehab centers um, in a nursing home now ever since that happened. I speak with her once or twice a week, and you can hear progress in her speech and um, the last week was the first, I got so excited about this because we were on the phone and she said, listen, if Birdland calls you about booking me again, <laughs> tell them I'll come. <laughs> yes, great. So that optimism was absolutely <laughs> wonderful to Sense hear. Sense of humor intact. Yep. Yeah. Oh, she's very, yeah, she, the spirit is there totally. Um, she's not very pleased with her, with the situation of being in the nursing home and um, just wants to, wants to break out. She to continue, break free. She keep, continually tells me about escape plans and I'm all, <laughs> I, it, it totally conjured up, conjures up that um, Olympia Dukakis movie with Brenda Fricker, um, 
cloudburst oh, okay. when they br- when mm-hmm. they break out of the nursing home, and mm-hmm. I have all these images, and I'm going, no, Carol, it's not a good idea. Well, make sure you film it, Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> it's a video era now. You got to have it yes, on. Yes, it is. On Somebody will have to have a phone going. Yeah. This is Little Girl Blue, one of the songs Carol performed at the Newport Jazz Festival 50 years ago, written by Rogers and Hart in 1935. When I was very young, the world was younger than I, as merry as a carousel. The circus tent was strong. With every star in the sky Above the ring I love so well Now the young world has grown old And gone are the tinsel And gold So sit there And count your fingers What can you do Old girl You're through Sit there and count your little fingers, unlucky little girl blue. That's just amazing. That's the song that really did it for her. I mean, that's the tune that put her on the map and landed her the recording contract with Columbia. And what was her life like in the years after that? She's very busy. I mean, she got so much attention so so quickly from that appearance at, at Newport. And when she did that song, the pianist didn't know the verse. And... She said, well, that's okay. Just give me an arpeggio and be flat or whatever, and I'll do it a cappella. And that's what she did. And then when by the time she finished the song, she said that there was, there, there was a group of people standing over in the corner of the stage that had come there 
while she was singing, she had no idea that it was Columbia Records and it was the New York Times and the New York Daily News. And she jokes that when she came off the stage, they said, well, young lady, do you know what you just did? Who? And she said, well, I, I sang a song. I thought that was what I was supposed to do. They said, no, you sang in tune. Mm. And she said, was I supposed to do otherwise? <laughs> <laughs> you know, singing out of tune did not come naturally to her. Yeah. 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 And her career's had some ups and downs. Mm-hmm. Pretty much like every major jazz artist or less than major, you know, it's it's a... She came back to Raleigh and was a legal secretary for a while? Yeah, she worked in Terry Sanford's law firm okay. for several years. And um, then would still sing and tour, take time off, take a week or two off and do a tour to Japan or whatever, and then come back and be right there at the law office and then come to the Frog at night. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's a great life, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't need to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> now, tell me, Stephen, about the documentary on Carol. How did it come about, and, and where is it in production? Well, it. Um, I'm trying to remember how, how the idea came about. We Carol was coming down to sing at a memorial service for Bob Spearman, mm. who had worked in the law firm in Raleigh, and. I said, you know, it's been so long since you've been down here. You haven't sung in North Carolina in over 20 years. We should try to find somewhere for you to appear while you're here. And she said, well, that that would be great if that happens. Um, But she was going to be staying at my house. And luckily, we were able to um, book a couple of nights at Sea Grace. Yes, sure. In Raleigh. And sold out instantly. And it just brought back a lot of great, great memories. And it was during that time we said, you know, we ought to, we ought to film this. We are, there's a documentary here with the story of Carol's life and career. And that's, that's when the film started. It's taken longer than we planned and ended up being a storyline of Carol's being booked back at Birdland in New York to record a live album, and that was in September of 2019. And so the film actually ends at the close of that set there at Birdland, uh, as far as the storyline goes. And we're still, we're in post-production now, and we're on the fifth iteration, and hoping that we're working towards having a final product before the, before the end of the year. But it's a full-length feature film about Carol and her career. So will it go out on streaming or will it hit the festivals or how does That's it That's all to be known, you know. Okay. I mean, it's all to be figured out. Hoping we'll certainly try to start out with some major, major festivals and then see where that takes us. Okay. You know? Does it have a title? The working title right now is Carol Sloan, Little Girl Blue. Oh. And then there's another title that's Carol Sloan, A Jazz Singer. Because we're wondering if the song title, if that implies a, a self-pity right. in, in my mind. And, and we don't, certainly don't want that to be the case. And that's yeah. not what that song's about. And it's a reference totally to the, that song being the number which kicked off her entire career. So no telling what the title's going to end up being. <laughs> <laughs> I've Got You Under My Skin was written by Cole Porter in 1936 and was nominated for a Best Original Song Oscar. It became the signature song for Frank Sinatra, also his son, Frank Jr., and also for the Four Seasons. Personally, I love the 1959 version by Louis Prima and Keeley Smith, who almost have as much fun as Carol and pianist Paul Montgomery in a recording from the famous Frog and Nightgown. Deep in the heart of me So deep in my heart You're really a part of me Well, I've got you Under my skin I've tried so Not to give in I said to myself This affair never will go so well 
Why should I try to resist When darling I know so well But I've got you Under my skin I'd sacrifice anything Come what might For the sake of having you near In spite of a warning voice In the night that repeats in my ear Don't you know Wake up to reality But each time I do just the thought of you Makes me stop before I begin oh, I've got you under my skin I've got you Yes, I've got you Under my skin I've got you Oh, I've got you Deep in the heart of me Deep in the heart of you, baby oh, So deep in my heart Real deep in your heart You're baby. really a part of me I've got you I said to myself, oh, that's a fair, never you talk to yourself so well. all day long. <laughs> but why should I try to resist? Don't try to resist, God. When I know so well, you know so well that, that you've got, got me. You. Yes, you got me. Sitting under my skin. Sitting under your skin, baby. Well, I would sacrifice anything, come what might. Yes, Father, say, God, having you need me in spite of a morning voice. A morning calling morning. in the night to be. And repeats and my hello, 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 hello. <laughs> booty, booty, booty. Use your mentality. I'll wait for you. Wake up to reality. <laughs> yeah, baby. But each time I do, just the thought of you makes me stop, stop. before I begin. It begins. Under my skin. You gonna do another I'll do it again. Mama, yes, darling. Go on. I've got you. Got you. Under my skin. Under my flesh. I got you. Oh, I have you. Deep in the heart of me. Right in your corpuscles. So deep in my heart. Deep in your heart. You're really a part of We have become one, baby. I've got you. Oh, oh, I have you. Under my skin. You tried so deep in the heart of me. Deep in the heart of you. <laughs> I forgot my place. You da, 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 da. But why should I try to resist when, baby, I know so well? I think I'm waiting you find the place. <laughs> I, got you. I think I found it. Under my skin. Under your skin, yes, baby. I won't sacrifice anything. Oh. I wake up to read. I'm awake, I'm awake, I'm awake. But each time I do just the, the thought of you, you makes me stop. Ooh, ooh. And I've got you. Oh, I've got you. Under my skin. Under my skin. Ooh, baby, I've got you. Oh, I've got you. Under my skin. Under my skin. Baby, I've got you. Baby, I've got you. Paul. That's right. <laughs> Man. They had such a good time together. Just their working relationships worth a, a film all on its own. Mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. It's just nothing like the two of them together. It's just it's wonderful. At Birdland, when you were recording the, the video, the movie, mm -hmm. uh, she caused quite a stir. I understand that she maybe got mistaken for uh, royalty. <laughs> <laughs> she did. 
She had taken the cab down to the club, and I was out there on the street waiting for her and saw the cab come up and went to get her luggage. And there was already a line of people out on the sidewalk waiting to come in for Carol's show. There were people who had flown from Japan for this set at Birdland. Wow. wow she's so, so popular there. And so we we're walking along, and the crowd is just going to kind of going bonkers, and we get to the stage door, and there is a guy rather out down on his luck, sitting on the concrete there, you know, wrapped up in a, a blanket, and just wide-eyed and could not figure out what all the, and the movie cameras were going as well, so there was just a oh, lot yeah. going on. And as I got to the door to open the door for Carol, he just starts tugging on my jacket and said, you know, hey, dude. What's going on, dude? What's happening? <laughs> and before I could even answer any, anything, he said, that's Queen Elizabeth, isn't it? Is that <laughs> Queen Elizabeth going in? And, you know, I just couldn't burst the bubble then. So I said, it absolutely is. Yes. And it just made his whole night. Yes, Queen Elizabeth has some great albums. <laughs> <laughs> right. How's your curtsy? <laughs> I've practiced. <laughs> yeah. Stephen, how can people contribute to Carol and her recovery? Well, we haven't started any sort of public campaign yet. Uh, they can certainly contact me if they wish to to do that. And it What's your email wonderful. address? Tell us. Stephen, Stephen with a P-H, at goingbarefoot.com. Okay. And then we have mo- um, information about the documentary film as well there at goingbarefoot.com. What would thrill Carol is just getting cards and notes from people. It, okay. it just is her lifeline right now. So if somebody wants that address, I'll be happy to give it to them and oh, that's know, great. So they can send something. Well, please give way. please give our best to Carol and yes, thanks so much for coming in do. today. Yeah, I'm going to visit her at the end of this month, so I'm very excited. It'll be the first time I've seen her since all this happened. Thanks for listening. U.S. Modernist Radio is underwritten by Wendy Robineau and Don Beskin and by Modernist Realtor Angela Roll. Okay, Tom, take us out. Visit usmodernist.org's massive archives to listen to past shows, discover documentation of 8,000 significant modernist houses, and access 3.2 million pages of classic 20th century architecture magazines. U.S. Modernist Radio is produced by Soundtracks Recording Studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. Our theme song is performed by George Smart and Robinson Earl. Rogue archivist Carrie Cesarino researches guests while dancing around the kitchen with her kids to Jimmy Buffett's Cheeseburger in Paradise. They like theirs with lettuce and tomato. U.S. Modernist Radio is a production of Modernist Archive Incorporated, a nonprofit educational archive for the documentation, preservation, and promotion of modernist residential design. I'm Tom Guild. George and I will be back soon with another Why Don't We Get Drunk and Talk About Architecture edition of U.S. Modernist Radio. Mm-hmm.